All right, hopefully you can hear me now and we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get started. Excellent. Um, hopefully the sound quality is good for everybody, everybody who's online. Uh, I'm gonna use this microphone. It might be a little disconcerting to use this microphone just because it helps with the audio quality of the of the uh, of the recording. And uh, and so I would like to welcome everybody to our first week of classes here at the at the University of Michigan. Welcome back. Hope everybody's having a good start to the to the new year. I am Professor Chad Jenkins, uh, and I will be leading this class. This is what we call the Auto Rob class, uh, which consists of a number of sections for uh, that I'll talk about in a second. But I just want to welcome you. This is this is a, a new experience for me because usually this class is about somewhere between between sixty to eighty, maybe eighty five students. And now this, this semester, we've got a lot more students, so I'm going to try my best to accommodate. And we hopefully will be able to get as many people in as possible, because I feel like I want to, if you're interested in, in learning about robotics, I want to teach you robotics uh, to the best of my ability. And what we're going to talk about a lot are mobile manipulation robots, uh, like this fetch robot. I'm still smarting after that game. Oh, my goodness. Like, you know, like, I don't, I don't know. That game was just so, it was so tense to watch. It was amazing to watch at the same time, but oh, well. Um, say la vie next year, right? Um, anyway, uh, and if you can't see my slides, just uh, just let me let me know. I would I would like to just start off and, and address some some for those of you who are who are waiting to 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 get enrolled or are in a remote section or want to try to get into an in person section. I work. We are feverishly working on all of these issues uh, as as we speak. Um, we have constraints with the with the room size, so I think the over the number that they're completely enrolled or uh, the number they're actually enrolled is about close to 200. Um, but our space, as you can see, only fits uh, only fits 128 here, and in the robotics building, we can only fit 150, uh, 158. And so we're going to try to make sure that we can get everybody accommodated who wants to take the class. Uh, if you don't get an email response from me, it doesn't mean I'm not working on your problem. I'm just trying to get through a lot of those things, and I will stay today and answer every single question that somebody has about the class. Or, or enrollments, or any questions that, that you have, I will stay and answer in per questions in person. If you're online, we will make sure that uh, if you're in a remote section, that we answer those questions as as well. Um, you know, it might take some time to get through everybody, but we're going to try to we're going to we're going to really try to do our, our best to make that happen. So, because that that's what means a lot to me that you know that we have good effective um, good effective communication, and we also want to want to make sure that people who are remote who are in the remote sections uh, have a good experience in this class as well and have a good learning uh, learning um, uh, learning outcomes. And so, I'd like to just uh, I'd like to just start by uh, by talking about. Uh, the, the course itself. So, um, so, so right now we have uh, we have five sections of this course that roughly covers the, a lot of the same. We, we cover a lot of the same core content. Um, it's going to be different depending on whether you're a graduate student or an undergraduate. Um, but we have Robotics 320, which is robot operating systems, which I forgot to put a, a quote next to. Um, but uh, but that's we both have that for in in person participation. I think most people are most people who are enrolled in 320 are in person. We may have some people that are remote. This is a core requirement for the robotics major. So if you were taking this class because you're trying to fill robotics major requirements. That's the that's the section you should be in. If you're in a computer science student, you're looking for upper level CS credit, um, then you should be enrolled in EECS 367. That's the traditional course that I've I've been teaching this year. Uh, Rob 320 and EECS, ECS 60, uh, 367 will look about the same. There might be small differences, but they'll be mostly the same course. That will change over time uh, because there are certain things that robotic students get exposed to that if you're a CS, if you're doing a CS major that you won't you won't you won't see, and we want to make sure that you see that. But at the same time, if you've come through and you've taken 281, you don't need me. You don't need to really hear me talk about heap sorts and uh, and out in and uh, and asymptotic complexity one more time. And so we're going to try to we're going to try to split those up over time. But that's not that's not uh, not something we're going to do first at the, at the first one. Um, if you're in robotics 511, I will ask more of your of the graduate students. So you're going to be it's going to be a little bit more open ended. We're going to ask you to do some extensions, some features. Most importantly, ask you to read some papers, some research papers, and then be able to translate those into, into code for some of our robots. And so the graduate students will we'll expect a little bit more out of you, but a lot of the same structure. And so with that, I would just like to welcome you 
to, to the Autorob course. So welcome to Autorob. Thanks for being here. We're excited to have you. Um, and uh, and so, uh, so what I want to talk about today as we just start to, to kick off this course, um, let me get, see if I can get rid of that. Um, uh, is really I want to I want to I want to just go through a number of things. I want to give some motivation for why we care about this, and so I'd like to like to talk about one of the most questions, one of the the the, the, the top questions I get as a roboticist, which is so where is my robot, <laughs> um, and uh, and then I'd like to give an over an overview of the course um, to give you a heads up on where we're going in terms of. Um, in terms of the, the class, uh, on Monday, we will release our first assignment. This is assignment zero, which is a, 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 a published subscribe to do a random walk controller and simulation for the uh, for using the Ross robot operating system. This will be, you only get a really a week to do it, but it's not that complicated. But it's to make sure that you can get your environment set up and you can start to work with our with our systems. And then there's gonna be some some things that we, uh, that we need from you today. Um, we would, uh, we, it'd be really great if you could look at the course website. I don't use Canvas. I don't use Piazza. If you're asking, then, <laughs> then you know, because I, I think, uh, I think we try to emulate more of like a development team style style format. And so, we're, so I do need you to join our Slack workspace. So pretty much all the communications are going to come through the website or through the, or through the, um, the Slack workspace. And then, uh, then it'd be great if you can complete a student workflow survey. So we like to make sure that we are doing our best to, to accommodate all the different uh, needs of students in the class. And so this is what we're gonna we're go what we're gonna do today. Um, it's just really an, just really initialization. There's one other thing I forgot to put on these slides is that I will release lectures. Um, and they will go online as, as pre-recorded videos. It'd be great if you could watch those ahead of time. Um, those will come out this weekend, but because I don't have them ready for today, I'm not gonna ask you to have that ready. Um, if you are online, if you're uh, if you're if you're joining us in the, one of the remote sections through Zoom, uh, you should. There's certain etiquette that I would just ask. Uh, that would be, you know, you can show your video if you want to. That's that's optional. It's always great to see people online. Um, most importantly, make sure your your sound is muted. And uh, and Liz, who is right there with me on Zoom, uh, is going to be is you and some of our course staff will be list, are going to be in the chat. So if you would like to ask a question, just feel free to put that into the into the chat, and we'll get to it. All right. So here's a question: What is the question that I get the most when I'm on campus? <laughs> Any guesses? <laughs> <laughs> <What's that? laughs> most people don't know I'm a roboticist so so you know so it's it's uh so once they know I'm a roboticist that's that that's not actually you know that's uh that's uh that's 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 the top question I get so where's my robot but uh but when people just see me around what do you think they ask me yeah what do you do what do I do <laughs> usually they're like what are you doing here uh kind of thing <laughs> but uh but sometimes I get that you know usually we're further along the conversation any other any other guesses on what what people ask me? Yeah. How are you? How are you? You know, if somebody's <laughs> nice, they will ask that. How are you? Julia High should come first before that, but that's cool. Any, any other guesses? Yeah. Directions. Directions. Yeah. If somebody's lost, sometimes that that'll happen, but uh, yeah. Right, right here. Well, yeah. where's Jesse Grizzle? Oh. <laughs> Too many people ask me that question. Yeah. Both. <laughs> yeah. What's your cat name? What's my cat name? Oh, see, you took Robotics 102 with me. I have a cat. His name is Katari 2600. Oh. Atari 2600 with cat. All right, yeah. What can I do with the robotics degree? What can I, you know, the, I get that one a lot. I am starting to get that one. I, I, you know, I will, for people that come to Pathways Lectures, Pathways Seminar, I, that gives a lot of props for me. One, one more guess? Yeah, Michael Robinson. Pocket uh, okay, calculator isn't working. Oh, no, all right. All right. <laughs> you're, you're, that's too much. Actually, the question I get the most, if you see me give talks, it's actually, uh, am, I, am I on the football team? Uh, and, and, you know, and, but now, nowadays, as I'm getting older, it's, and do, I have, do I have a child who's, who's, who might be playing on the football team? I, I get that one. Sometimes people ask me, when will I graduate? Um, if I'm, if I'm not, if I shave, if I, if I'm like shaving my head, I, I get that. If I'm, if I'm like I am now, it's sort of like, I don't get that question. Uh, but, um, but actually the one thing that should be, that's interesting is that we do a lot of, uh, we do a lot of, um, let me see if I can hide this. Is there a way to hide this? 
<laughs> Got to put my glasses on. All right, hi, video panel. No, that's not it. Um, show video panel. Hide floating meeting controls. All right, I like that better. Um, so, uh, so, so actually, we do a lot of outreach, or we have a lot of visitors come through our come through our uh, come through our lab, and we show robots off. And so, one question they ask me is: Is a roboticist a real job? <laughs> Can you do that? Um, <laughs> And I've been answering that question for years. And, you know, and the, the great thing I can say is, and I didn't even think it was possible for me, but yes, this is a real job. I'm looking out in this room and seeing so many people that will be roboticists and do amazing things. It is, it is a pleasure. It's a huge, huge honor to be able to, to, to guide you into that pathway. But that's usually followed by all sorts of other questions, <laughs> such as, will robots take my job? Are you building R2-D2? Will robots take over the world? Can your robot bring me a drink? Can I work at your lab? I get a lot of those. The, can I work in your lab? Will come if, midway through the semester. I'm happy to answer that question for everybody here. Yeah. Um, do you mostly get these questions from elementary schoolers? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You'd be surprised how many people ask me of all ages. Ask me, will robots take over the world? That is like, if we post a video on YouTube, that will be the number one topic for for the comment section, which is why why we disable comments these days. <laughs> So, so, you know, yeah, no, we get it. We trust me. These are, these are all across the, all across the, the range of range of, 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 of people. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about, so, so where is my robot? Um, and the reality is, uh, with that, is that your robot's already here. If you're, if you're wondering, um, you don't have to go far. You can just be around campus and see autonomous cars driving by. You can see drones in, in various places. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, we can, we have all sorts of things. We have drones, we have robots working in manufacturing, autonomous cars, telepresence robots. Um, you know, if you think about, you know, like one of those Amazon Alexa on wheels, you know, you're starting to see those, that Amazon Astro is, is one that they have. Um, you know, and so these robots, so robots are already here. You can buy a robot and start doing things with it right now. But usually when people say robot, what they really mean is they mean mobile manipulation robots. They mean robots that can work, or that can move around human spaces and can do things in the types of areas that we populate as humans, can work with the things that we work with as humans. They're capable of mobility in human spaces and they're capable of what we call manipulation, dexterity, working with stuff, using your hands in those real spaces. When you think about what science fiction tells us what a robot should look like, that's, that's usually these mobile manipulation robots. And those are gonna be the focus of what we do in this class um, this semester. <clears throat> and so here comes another question for you. So, so these two robots right here, uh, one of those is, the, is a fetch robot. So that's what that we're going to be using a lot of those. I took that just upstairs on, on Bice Room third floor. But the other one is the Willow Garage PR2 robot. Uh, that was I bought that one back when I was at Brown University. I bought that one in about 2000, 2011 or so. Um, here's a, but here's the question for, for you. Um, I don't know if, if people know what one of my favorite shows is. And maybe I'm saying my age, but one of my favorite shows is The Price is Right. I love The Price is Right. Anybody know what Price is Right is? Anybody watch that? All right, a few people, right? So, so if you're not if you're not familiar with The Price is Right, um, these are going to be our items up 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 for bid, and uh, and so so I want you to try to guess how much these robots cost, as close as possible without going over. That's The Price is Right rule. I should actually bring four people down and you should guess on them. <laughs> I should, this actually room is actually good for it. You can actually come on down uh, to this. I'm not gonna do that. That's gonna take too much time, but, but, but I want some guesses. How much, and we can get some people in the chat to, to guess too. Liz is gonna be your voice if you're in the chat. How much, do these, how much do these robots cost without going over? And I promise you they're not $1. Yeah. I think 75,000. Okay. And 140. 75,000, 140, all right. 3,000. 3,000? All right. Any other guesses? There's 2 million in the chat. 2 million in the chat. All right. Here we go. What, what's... Uh, the one on the left is uh, 20,000. 20,000. All right. 12K. Well, right. 12K. All right. 50K. 50K? I, I like those, those ideas. 24,000. 24, <laughs> right. Yeah. I would say 125K. 125. All right. All right. 
Omer, yeah. Even Price is Right, uh, $1. One dollar. See, there we go. <laughs> there go. You're that guy on the Price is Right. Yeah, Liz. We have a very precise 4,579. <laughs> <laughs> all right, there we go. All of these, all of these are good guesses. I have to, I have to say. Um, the reality is you guys are, are kind of low. Um, so uh, so if I plotted this out over time, so if I said, you know, which year that I got to put time on the horizontal axis, put cost on the vertical. Uh, when I bought the Willow Garage PR2, which was really one of the first mobile manipulation robots you could buy, it cost me about $400,000. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then when I came to Michigan in 2015, my first purchase was that Fetch robot which they've made hundreds of or so, um, that was $100,000. If I compare it to the first robot, the first real robot that I, I really worked with, that was the NASA robot at the, the Johnson Space Center. This, they put this robot on the International Space Station. It was helping astronauts do various, various tasks. Uh, I worked with that robot back in 2002. Any, anybody, any guesses on how much that one cost? Quick guess. A million? Two mil? All right, I'm going to average in the back. 45. 40, 45. There we go. There we go. That's the equivalent of the one dollar for the for, for by NASA standards. Uh, no, actually, uh, I'll average those two guesses, and I'll say it's about a million and a half. I don't know. I don't actually know for sure because I don't. NASA never, NASA never never published it, but a million and a half. They don't. I don't think they balk at that number. Um, and so you know, so what you can say is is if we're looking at the economies of scale, they built about three of the three or three to five of those NASA robots. They built about 60 Willow Garage PR2 robots. And as you and the fetches, they've they've built hundreds of those. If we if we try to predict out what this could look like, I love linear algebra. For those of you who took robotics 101, thank you. Um, and uh, you can use the tools from linear algebra to plot out a polynomial of what, you know, to make to, to see what what could, you know, what could this trend look like? And so back in back in 2016, 2017, I made a guess. I, I sort of looked at the trend and I said, you know what? Your robot, your mobile manipulation robot is going to be about $40,000 in 2020, right? And we're in 2022. Was I, was I right? Was I, was I, was I okay? Was, was that a reasonable thing to do? And, and then, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, was, it actually wasn't too bad because, um, because what we saw uh, recently in the press re recent years is Hello Robot has a platform that's come out. It's not full mobile, mobile manipulation, but it's about $17,000, right? That's pretty good. Boston Dynamics has a pick and place system for warehouses. It's not, that's much more than $40,000, but, but the same way that with different computers, you can get a different, different range. You, know, you get high, super high-end computers, you can get low-end computers. Um, and I think really one thing that's really awesome that's on the horizon is, uh, is are, the, are, the human, are the bipedal locomotion robots that could walk around and go upstairs and all sorts of terrain. That's coming too. And those are about $250,000. And you can see how these prices are going to come down. The same way that a computer used to fill up this entire room and cost a tremendous amount of money. Now you have something that is orders of magnitude faster than that that fits inside your pocket. And I just, and I can get one on, on contract with a phone plan, right? Um, this, this is where we're going in terms of the robot hardware. Yeah, question. What's driving that cost to go down? Uh, because we, we have so many needs in our society for, for robots. Um, what's driving the cost down is computing is getting cheaper and faster. Uh, the, the parts for building these things, or you have more needs for them. So for autonomous driving, drones, warehouse, supply chain, um, medical, medical robotics, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk more about some of those applications. But as you're seeing this technology get out, more people need it, you have more, that, that's driving the, the demand. And as you can build more of them, you can, the economies of scale can make it, make it cheaper and cheaper. And so that's what, that's, this is coming. Where computing was, let's say about 30 years ago, when I was when I had a an IBM 286 uh, computer, or maybe 20 years ago when I had a Pentium, my 90 my 90 uh, my 90 megahertz Pentium, you can see how that exponential just grew. That's we're at the beginning of that for robotics in terms of the, the hardware and the platforms. So that's just the hardware. But what about the smarts for this thing, the brains for these types of these types of systems that's going to actually make them autonomous? When I was a graduate student, um, everything was mostly done through what we call teleoperation, which is a, which is, means remote control. And so that teleoperation meant that the robot would um, 
would uh, we, we would have somebody that would be smart. They would wear like a head mounted display and we have motion capture on them and they'd be able to, to move around and the robot would sort of follow them. In the past 20 years, what we've seen is, uh, is, is the rise of what we saw, what we call, what I'll call pick and place. So the robot can go pick something up from one location, drop it off at another. So the ultimate in this is sort of autonomous driving. Autonomous driving is picking you up at one location, driving you collision free to another location and dropping you off. We can do that with mobile manipulation systems as well. And so this is just a small example of just picking up a fold, a binder and putting it somewhere else. And so that means that we have to be able to sense our world, understand how, what, where, where we would be in collision and then make plan, do essentially planning to understand uh, how we can get, get to a location collision free. Where we're going with this is the ability to do what we call what I'm calling taskable autonomy, which is we're going to see all of these various different types of robots and they're going to do a task for me. And so that really is, is where we're going to go. You know, fix the water heater, make my breakfast, um, you know, go, go, go the same way you can ask a, a, another person to do something. We want robots to be able to do this for us as well. And so the way this sort of stacks up is that you have the hardware at the beginning teleoperation, pick and place, the taskable autonomy, which is sort of like the applications we want. And we want to deliver those services to users. And so, um, and so, and we also want to do more than just pick something up and put it somewhere. We all know to do various tasks that involve dexterous manipulation. So the NASA robonauts up there are using tools and then trying to, using those tools to, to accomplish some sort of assembly task. Uh, you have robots that are making breakfast, robot soft manipulators that are doing sample collection under the sea. Um, you have robots, this is from the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Uh, my colleagues at Track Labs had, had robots driving cars. Um, <laughs> And so, so all those require dexterity with the hands and to do something more than just grossly picking something up and putting it somewhere else. And so if we, and so all of these functions have to sit on, on modern computers. So these are the computers that, these are just sort of samples of different types of computers that we have to run, that we want to run this autonomy on. Um, and on those computers, what we have is sort of a stack. You know, we have a, that sits in terms of what, what we call an operating system. We're all using an operating system that essentially allows us to at, write applications that can run on, uh, run on computing hardware. And so the way that we think about those applications is, uh, is through, is, is, sorry, where we think about an operating system in general is that it is system software that manages computer hardware, software resources, and provides common services for computer programs. I took that from Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of a bland thing. I actually like this other, other definition. Hopefully you can see it. Um, it. An operating system, what's real job is, is to be a special program that runs on the bare hardware, or at least some reasonable version of it, and hides the gory details of managing processes and devices from applications that sit on top of it. An operating system is what allows me to write an application and not have to worry about this specific driver or this way of managing the process or dealing with memory. And so that operating system is really important. We have to run on top of that. And so if we can do that, that sits on, we can run on, we can have a hardware, we run on top of an operating system, we'll develop applications that will serve users. But when we're thinking about robots, there's something in the middle because we have to think about what kind of manipulation tasks we want to do. And so if we're thinking, making this analogy between operating systems and what we need for robots, what we oftentimes have are hardware at the low level, an operating system that we run on, and then there's something in the middle that we do that will then produce an application from a ro for a robot that will then serve users. And that thing is what we call a robot operating system what I'm calling a robot operating system. A robot operating system is a special program that runs on top of the operating system that hides the gory details of controlling robot devices, uh, autonomy processes, and sensory motor routines. This provides an abstraction between the, between the operating system and the robot op and the robot and the, the the ecosystem of robot applications, so that we can provide a platform to run seamlessly across a number of different robots that need uh, mobility or dexterity. That's what we're trying to build in this class. And so the way things will look is that we'll have hardware, we'll have any kind of robot that you could think of. That's an open chain robot. I won't get into detail of that, but but if somebody gives you a robot hardware, you could say, "Great, I'm going to take that hardware." I'm gonna put my favorite operating system on top of it. 
And then I'm going to, I can usually just pick one of these operating robot operating systems that, that sit on top of that. And then I can start to write applications and do, do things for my users. Um, one thing that we should note is that an operating system, if you, if you are taking operating systems class, there's a number of things that you have to check off that are important things to do across all of these operating systems. The main job of, a, of an operating system is to do program execution, manage processes if you have multiple processes running in your operating system, like every modern operating system does, manage your memory, manage the file system, interface with devices, talk to other, other, other computers over the network. Similarly, as those are common to every, almost every operating system, a robot operating system has a number of things that it has to do. It has to, to be able to do perception uh, from our sensory data. It has to, we have to have the ability to make decisions, to, to issue control commands, uh, to the robot to make it move, at least in, and for a robot operating system, it'll be relatively low frequency, not high frequency control. We have to manage kinematics and how we think about our space. It serves as the device interface at the level of software. And we also oftentimes have to run some sort of dynamical simulation so it can make predictions about its world. This is at the core. These are the properties that we have to do for a robot operating system. Oftentimes when people ask me, so the most popular robot operating system is ROS. By far, this is ROS is quote unquote the robot operating system. And, uh, and so ROS is, does all of these things. Um, and people, students will always often ask me, will I learn ROS in this class? And I will say, sure, you'll learn a little bit, but you'll learn about as much in, of ROS in this class as if you took the operating system class here, as much as they would teach you about Windows 11, right? It would be an interesting test case to think about some of these things, but I'm not going to but they don't teach you Windows 11 itself. They teach you how to build your own Windows 11 with some examples that help you to help you get going. And that's where we're what we're going to see in this class. And so when we're laying all that out, so 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 then we have so if we are successful in building these ro everything up to this robot operating system, then these robot applications in the middle are really going to be the apps of the future. If you're if we are successful in and and I've been successful in teaching you everything in this class you're going to you you may develop a new robot operating system one we haven't even seen before that could enable the the app stores of the future and so when you want somebody to do a task for you we're really asking can we start to have robots that can make our world programmable the same way that computers have made virtual information digital information and virtual worlds programmable our robots going to be able to do that and we can do that through through something that has been long envisioned in the robots robotics community is, which is how to make a robot app store. So you can have so lots lots of people tried. We're still working on it, but you need the robot operating system to make the robot app store. And we're still we're still we're still going there. Um, one of the interesting cases is actually one of the the founder of of Open Robotics, which which is the producer of of Ross. Uh, he, he gave this interesting talk about 13 years ago about what a robot app store could look like. And he made this idea of map it. You know, you could have a mapping system that could, um, it could just go around and it could, you know, and it could just, uh, it could produce a map for you. And that would just be an application that you would get. You don't have to take ECS 467 or 550 or with owner, uh, you don't have to take with robotics 330, you know, you don't have to do that. You can just you download a map, right? Uh, download a download system for doing this. And that actually turned out to be pretty, pretty true that, that back in 20, 2009, this was just an idea, but now you could go on the, on the actual Apple App Store and buy something that will actually do 3D scanning for you. Um, the difference is it doesn't cost $49.99. It it's free. You can get it for free, but you got to buy their sensor. Um, but you know, but this is but but those same sensors that sit on top of uh, that you can that you have for your phone on your iPhone, uh, they also sit on our robot too. And so we can start to think about what those types of applications could look like um, for a robot, not just your iPhone, but for a robot as well. And where we want to get to is that these types of systems, this is more than just this class, but these types of systems will work in your home environment. You know, it's usually not the nice, clean environment you're thinking about. It's messy. It's got all sorts of stuff. My kids keep my, my house a mess. Um, they're getting better about it as they're getting older. But, um, but we want a, a robot that can function in all of these types of environments with all the uncertainty that's given to it. We want to develop what I would consider to be a full, full, full stack software solution that can allow any robot to perform any task in any environment that it's capable of functioning in. And that is what we're doing 
partially through this class, but also through other classes in the robotics, uh, robotics undergraduate curriculum. I'm going to skip this, but but uh, but basically, uh, this, one of the things that we're going to think about is there's many different ways that you can program robots. Um, the thing that we want to think about is how performant it's going to be, how it's going to scale to new tasks dynamically, and what is going to be the ease of interaction. That's really the goal for robotics. Something that just sits on your on your on your robot, it scales to new tasks, and it works with people effectively. And the kind of things that we want to do are going to be. Um, are going to be a number of different applications. Um, you know, if we're talking about the applications that are really driving robotics and moving forward, part of that is the dirty, dull, and dangerous. Basically, autonomous driving, infrastructure inspection, things like nuclear cleanup. Uh, um, those, are, those are big things that we have to think about. But on the other side, there's also social robotics. Those are robots that, you know, that can help us engage with people, um, help, help, help people feel better, help educate more people, um, you know, um, help maybe do things like treat autism, um, rehabilitation after a stroke. Um, those are things that we can do with these types of robots as well. Um, and there's another, a number of different areas, medical robotics, agriculture, exploration, manufacturing, security, um, you know, uh, secure, uh, and, and really thinking about the ethical use um, in addition to lethal force, which is why we need to think a lot about the ethical use. All of these things are gonna be the ecosystem that are going to, that, that, your, that your robots are gonna be performing in. And this is really, we're at the beginning of, the, of the seeing the, the, the exponential growth in, this, in, this, in these domains. And so all of those robot applications are going to be sitting here, and that's what your that's what your robot operating system is going to be building us up towards. But really, I would like to say don't don't just use those, don't just use ROS or LCM or those things. Um, make your own, and that's what we're that's what really what we're what we're coming up to. I'm looking forward to seeing the day that you that I that I have a student from this class develops a new robot operating system. And I'm like, wow, look at that. That's cool, amazing. Look at the new things we can do with that. Um, but in order to make that happen, if we think about all the different capabilities you have to have inside of your, your robot operating system, you're gonna have a lot of those, a lot of these modules that are gonna be sitting around for planning, uh, reasoning, perception, coordination, decision making, and kinematics for reasoning about space. And all of these systems are gonna be talking to each other as well. So they're gonna they're gonna have they're gonna need some form of interprocess communication, which hopefully I'm gonna be able to talk talk about uh, in detail. And so uh, and so, well, in, in, a, in a, a little little bit of detail, we're going to cut. We're going to touch upon an, uh, on on a on a uh, on a number of these. We're not going to go into it in extreme depth, but that's where we have upper level electives and other things that you can you can study. But we're going to cover path and motion planning. We're going to talk a little bit about dynamical simulation and feedback control. Forward and inverse kinematics is really at the heart of what we what we do, and 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 that really is how do we represent a robot in space and be able to have its interfector reach something and grab something. That's inverse kinematics that's going to let us do this. And we have to make sure that we don't bump into things. So we got to think about a little bit about collision detection as well. And so these are this is going to be the space of things that we cover uh, in this class. Um, so one one of the common complaints, I, I typically ask students, you know, like, you know, what's the, the students that that had to take the class, what, what was the thing that you that we could do to improve the class? Um, and make it better. They would say, work with real robots. And then I would say, real robots are expensive and I don't have that kind of money. Um, but, but there is one thing I can do is that every, all the code that you're gonna write will be able to interface with the robot. And you're gonna do that at least once. You're gonna, you're gonna have your code connect to our fetch robot and see your robot, see your code actually, actually working, uh, working with a real robot at least once in this class. And we're gonna make that happen. So can't do everything with the real robot. Well, we'll do some things with the real robot until I win the lottery and can provide more robots in this class. All right.